Thank you, God, that you're present wherever we are, Lord, whether we're in the trench or on the mountaintop. That you're even over the jail this morning, God. You're in the prison. You're in the palace. You're in Puerto Rico. You're, you're all over the world, Lord. You're in Korea. Your spirit is everywhere. Knows everything about everything. Thank you, God, that you're going to tell us things so we understand that, the, that, the, that you've not left your church in the dark. Thank you, Father. We give you honor this morning. We give you praise. We give you honor. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody says, amen. 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 Give God a hand clap this morning. You're not in the dark. You're not in the dark. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Amen. Some of you know, you think of those tragedies. Some of them are so big, you don't know how they're even going to get started on them. They're too big. Amen. So we've got to pray that God works out whatever is necessary to help those people. I know we got to do it because we got hands and we got feet and we got money, but sometimes all that doesn't even get it done. You have to have a good plan and a, something that big, don't you? Amen. How many of you got a plan? How many of you got a plan? You got to have a plan, right? Amen. You know, we're going to talk about personal harvest today. You know, I believe you have lots of kinds of harvests. I think nations have harvests. I think that individual lives have, har have harvest. Businesses have harvest. As a matter of fact, a lot of corporations, you know, they plan so far ahead. Like when they come out with a new iPhone and stuff, they, they plan success eight or nine years away sometimes 10 years away. So they, they realize that you have six life cycles of, of products and you have things, seasons change. What I think of the church, you know, the church has to change too. It just can't change its message, but it certainly has to change its methods. Because, you know, like I always say, we're not still on horseback, I'm glad. I was a long, been a long way back this week if <laughs> I rode a horse. But things change, and, and you have to change with them. When I say you have to change with them, you've got to change the methods. But you can't change your character or what you believe. Your foundations have to remain. Anyway, uh, personal harvest, I think that there's, there's seasons and, and, and there's plateaus, right? You know, a farmer gets bigger. The more he gets bigger, the more he plants, the more he has influence, and the more he touches people, right? If you think about it. When you farm, you notice farms just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger when they're productive. They, they don't stay small. So what do you do? Uh, I think there's four stages, personally. Plow, plant, cultivate, and harvest. Uh, plowing, I think, is the hardest thing, to, personally. Because when I, when I look at, when I think of plowing in a, someone's personal life, uh, you know, when you plow in somebody's life with words, that's what God does is he plows with words. And uh, when you, you, you plow some, and you can have some uh, tillage, and you can plant some things, but eventually, you know, a lot of times you run into really, really hard places when the ground is hard. I, I, have, I have a small garden at my house. It's probably maybe eight by eight. And the ground is so hard that it is literally turned into a bowl. It's not really a... I've, I've, I've fixed the dirt on the top through putting stuff in it. But down below it, the ground is so hard, when the tiller hits it, it bounces back up out of the, out of the pot. I've literally got a, made a flower pot in the, middle, in the middle of the yard. And the only time I ever got that ground tilled in the first place was not when it, just not when it rained right away, but when it rained and about a day later you could till it, but after it either got too dry or too wet, you couldn't do it. So timing, literally, you just can't go till this property I live on. You have to time it according to the weather so you could even get it to till. And uh, I was thinking of when people don't allow God to plow their heart because they want to be stubborn, then the conditions have to make another circle so you can get enough moisture to be plowed to get the rocks out of your life I think you all know this. I mean, most of the time, the, the, the preacher's words are supposed to be as goads. You know that, right? Now, I didn't write that. That's the last chapter of Ecclesiastes. 
And it says the preacher tries to find acceptable words to deliver his message. And I think that, uh, I personally believe this, you know, I've been doing this a little while, and ministry is, is very risky to tell people what God wants to tell them because they believe you're wrong, they believe you don't see it, and they believe you don't know it, and they believe you don't know their circumstances. And I would tell you several of those are true, but all you know is what God is telling them at the time. You don't know all those other things. And it's just as well you don't know all those other things because when you do, you feel like that stuff gets in your way. So when you go to tell people things, it's like plowing that, that yard I've got sometimes, you know? The tiller bounces back out of the, of the hole that's trying to, because you see, in order to have your life change, somebody's got to till it so you can put a new seed in it. Because it doesn't change without a seed. That's where we get like disconnected. Your life will not change without a seed. A seed has to enter into your person and grow something else. Uh, because the hearts are so hard that they won't receive the seed. And so you stay stuck in something for decades because your heart is so hard that the tiller can't till it up enough to drop one seed in it. Because Jesus said that if you don't understand the parable of the sower, you won't understand anything. I mean, literally, he says, How, if you, this is the mother of all parables, as Copeland would say. If you don't understand this parable, how then will you understand any parables? That means if you don't understand the, the seed and harvest, you don't understand the kingdom of God. And you guys would also know this. Uh, when you plant something, it, it grows whether you like it or not sometimes. So, so the, the ground can't refuse the seed. You can't, you know, I always say this, you've never seen the ground spit out a seed and say, I'm not taking that here today. Okay? The ground, if it's tilled, it receives the seed. So this morning, you know, I, I pray that you're open and you'll allow your heart to be tilled in the areas that, that are stuck. Because God's not dead and he's not out of power. And he ain't on vacation. I went on vacation. God didn't go on vacation. <laughs> Okay, Pastor Ian and I went on vacation, but God didn't go on vacation, and I'm sure he dealt with every one of you in our absence because he's the chief shepherd. And I always say, we're not hirelings, okay? We are not hirelings. There's a difference. A hireling will run away when the wolf comes, but we're not the chief shepherd. He is the chief shepherd, and someday I trust the fact that 1 Peter 5 is true and that he will give us a crown for being shepherds, okay? You trust that. But he's the boss. We work for him, of course. Plain and simple. I like saying that. Do you know that makes me feel good? Isn't it funny? I like having a covering. I like having a boss. I like having knowing that I'm connected to the throne via the lineage, via the linkage, via the relationships. But I'm connected. I do not do this alone. He that sent me is with me, and I'm never alone. So... I'm very comfortable talking about Jesus, and I'm very talk comfortable talking about the gospel. Uh, I own it. I don't have to go get it. I don't have to go work it up. I don't have to think. Sometimes when I'm making sermons, I have found that I have the sermon already, and I'm overdoing it because I, I got to, I you know, you get this religious box you got to get in where you got to have a sermon, but when you live it, you own it, and you can speak it anytime, anywhere, in any place because it's who you are with God. I don't have to get ready to preach. I have to make sure I'm preaching the right topic is pretty much what I got to do. Does this make sense to any of you? That's why witnessing should be as natural as you opening your eyes in the morning. Because when you're a Christian, when you own it, you can't help but not talk about it. You know, if you're a cook, you can't help but like making certain foods. Why? Because that's who you are. When you are genuinely connected, and I, I, you know, we can be Christians in name and you can go to heaven, too, you know, if you've, if you've repented. But that Christianity is so much bigger than just going to heaven. It's victory. It's victory. It's meant for your victory. Well, anyway, uh, you know, I think we're navigating something new every day. How many of you love having young people around? It's a, it's a love, love relationship, really. It's a funny thing about young people. They don't know what you knew, but you don't know what they know either. It's a, 
They're, they're, when you want to find out what's going on, you, you actually got to go talk to them when you want to talk about their perspective of current because you don't know it. You're measuring it from all the experience you have and they're seeing it for what it is at the moment. They have a, they have a photograph that's taken of like this page, but when you look up, you see the whole picture, but you might miss the details on the page. So they're closer to this era, this point in time. Amen. That's why young people need old people and old people need young people. It's, it's, a, it's a mutual win. It's a very good gift to be surrounded by young people. I thank God for all the young people we have in our church and all the young people that are coming up. As you see them running around, they're about this tall. It's great, isn't it? How do you like having all those kids around? Isn't it wonderful? It's the best thing in the world. Kids, uh, kids do it. So anyway, number one, I think this is, this is really number one. You have to respect the season you're in. You can't refuse a season. It's like refusing winter or trying to refuse summer. You prefer some seasons better than others, but how to, if you refuse the season, then you're refusing what's supposed to go on in that season in your life. We all know Ecclesiastics uh, chapter 3 says that there's a time for every purpose under heaven, right? There's, there's a time to die, time to be born Time to plow, time to, you know, a time for everything. And I think that if, if you live too disconnected and don't discern the time, you're doing the wrong thing in the wrong season and you miss your window. You guys would know this, those of you who planted gardens. If you don't plant it, you've got to wait another year to plant it. So that means you've got to go through three more seasons before you can put your seed in the ground. I don't know about you, but if you were living on what you planted, that would be a severe crisis. That could create some real problems in the wintertime that you didn't plant in the spring. So you can't be stubborn or be in denial of what season you're in because you literally prolong your situation so much longer than it needs to be. And if, and if there's stubbornness in you and, or rebellion... Uh, you'll love this. I, I have found this just with kids or anybody. The best way to find out is just to, to get, tell somebody to do something and watch what they do. That's the easiest way to find out if they're, going, if they're sub insubmissive or not. Because if you tell them what to do and they tell you why they're not going to or they don't think you're right, then, you know, that means you have no influence and you have really, if you don't have any relationship there, you really don't have much connection, right? Amen? Isn't that how it goes? I mean, your kids have to see you as a father so when you correct them, they heed what you say. If they don't see you as that, then the disconnection is made. That's why the Bible says if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get the prophet's reward. If you see the ministry gift for what it is, you're going to get what that ministry gift has to give you. Is anybody with me? Wisdom could be sitting around, you know, and nobody know it's there, or, or a healing gift, or an administrative gift. And if you're not aware of it, it could be sitting in Jesus. They didn't recognize Jesus, so I, I never feel bad at all because if they didn't know who he was, surely they could not easily miss me. You know what I'm saying? Because he's God. And if they missed him, and they missed their, Jerusalem missed their time of visitation, and their house was left to them desolate because they missed their visitation. Jesus, they missed the Son of God incarnate with full manifestation of healing, anointing, power, wisdom, everything. Because Jesus was God incarnate and sinless. That's why he was born of a virgin. So God himself took on a body and came to the earth, and the earth didn't know who he was. Isn't it scary that Jesus could be in your midst and you wouldn't know, but it's highly possible because he said, if you could see and hear, I could heal you. But because of the hardness of your heart, I have not been able to. That's how much it matters how soft your heart becomes. Now you know why it's so important to be healed of the wounds that you've gotten throughout your lifetime and to forgive the people that have hurt you and that have offended you and damaged you. Because if you do not forgive, the seed that you need to change your life cannot get in to your heart and bring you a different harvest. So you cyclically can be angry at everyone, submitted to no one, and stuck with what you think, and that's all. 
It's Holy Ghost preaching, Pastor Rena. I'm just telling you right now, you know that. I don't mean that bad, but I'm, I'm learning as I'm going. How many of you can admit that? Sometimes you hear God talking through you, and you think, my goodness, you know, the Lord's trying to deliver something today. I'd rather he preach anyway. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, let's face it, you know. Holy Ghost is the best preacher there is. There is nobody like him. There's nobody like God, nobody. It's funny how the, the world doesn't want to accept him, and he made the place. Isn't that weird? He made the place, furnished it. We're all breathing. Planets are all spinning perfect. Everything's working, but he ain't here. It's almost crazy to think like that, isn't it? I wonder what you got to tell yourself to pretend there's no God. No person's the same. Nobody's alike. You might look a little bit like somebody, but you're not them. Every single person has their own unique character. Only God could do such a thing. It's just too, it's too perfect to be an accident. So anyway, uh, so when you pay attention to what season you're in, you know, if you're in school, learn while you're in school. If God's given you a mentor, chase the mentor. Make sure you don't miss the impartation. It's also, I, I've seen this, I've seen seasons where people, God brought them a mate. Whether they were male or female doesn't matter. But because of their previous wounds and all the things that were wrong, but in their perception, their mate, their marriage mate came and went. And it didn't consummate and it didn't take place. And those people missed out on families. They've missed out on a lot of good things because they wouldn't let go of their history and wouldn't let God heal their history. So they forfeited their future by biting onto the past and not letting go. So you really, you really, you can tell, tell life, you have to pay attention to it. You have to discern the weather of the season you're in. If God is, is wanting you to, to find somebody to live with, live with you for the next 50 years, and you are too busy working and you're thinking about money, you can forfeit it like Scrooge did, you know, in the movie. That's what he did. He forfeited his relationship with a wonderful woman who got smart enough to break that relationship off because she saw it wasn't going to go anywhere because he wouldn't let go because he grew up in poverty. He would not let go of his poverty spirit to enjoy the prosperity that God was going to give him. So he forfeited a family. That is how important it is to let go of your own wounds, your own hurts, because by not letting go, you literally are stuck right there. Now, that's when you start saying things like, I give all the time. I know I'm being a good Christian. It doesn't mean a thing. What matters is your heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And uh, your heart really matters. David was an adulterer and a murderer when it was over, and God said, he's after my heart. Interesting, isn't it? Isn't it interesting that God's so good, he doesn't hold that horrible things against you? <laughs> Only God can be such that, like that. So you're not beyond his reach this morning, just to let you know. I hope you haven't killed nobody and not told nobody, but <laughs> David killed somebody, tried to keep it a secret, and God exposed it and still saved him from himself. So if that's big enough, God can surely redeem your life. He can surely redeem your life back from destruction of any kind. You are not beyond God's reach only if you want to be. Interesting, isn't it? You got you to be want to be. Anyway, uh, so you need to pay attention to the season you're in. We all know Genesis 8, 22. I've quoted it a lot, but you could put it up there, brother. I'd be grateful, or sister, I'm sorry. Uh, it says, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter. In other words, I know that I can always plant, period. Why? God said, while the earth remains, so I should never be hungry or starving or in lack. 
because I can trust it because he said it. Now, you might think that's so obvious, but you know I remember those things when I'm in a jam. When something's not going right, I pull those things out of my foundation so I do the right thing at the right time in a crisis. Because if you don't have good reference points, you don't make good decisions when things are not right. Cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Hallelujah. That's a build, that's a cornerstone, man. That's a cornerstone that you should never be stuck. Now, God, Matthew uh, 9.38 says that the Lord is the Lord of the harvest. Okay? That means you can't force a harvest. You can't manipulate a harvest. All you can do is cooperate with the laws. Till the ground, plant the seed, weed it, water it, and harvest it, but you can't do anything to make it go faster. And if you do, which we do now, our food supply is a mess, but we're not going to go there on a Sunday morning. There is nothing that they haven't altered, touched, or manipulated, and it's no different. When you begin to mess with what God made, there will be side effects. You can't change things that God made and not have bad results because he made them so they work perfect. Because he's perfect in all of his ways. We just sang, he's perfect in all of his ways. And now we need to quit singing it. Amen? So anyhow, he's in charge of your harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. Now Abraham got a promise from God and he tried to control his harvest and we wound up with Ishmael. Okay? Anytime you try to speed it up, I, I, please forgive me, but I'm touching everything today a little bit. But I've seen people say they're in faith and they believe it's God and they do all that stuff and they're just as broke 10 years later than they was when they started because they forced everything. Forcing it, forcing it. You got to cooperate with harvest. You can't force a harvest. You can't force money back to you. You can't force corn to grow today by five o'clock. There are things you are just flat out, not in charge of, never going to be in charge of, and you have to accept that God's word is true, and all you can do is cooperate with what God said, and you will gradually increase over time. That's why it takes faith and patience to inherit promises, because those two qualities are necessary for you to wait and trust that God's fixing your problem with your marriage, that God's fixing your finances, that God's fixing your health, that God's fixing things. Because the law of seed time and harvest always works. We want to fix it now so we get in the way of the long-term repair. How many of you ever fixed cars? Please forgive me. It's like putting brakes on a car with bad rotors, you know? I mean, you can stop, but it isn't going to be right. There'll be some side effects, you know? I mean, there's, when you do it, you got to do it right so it works. But if you try to do it because you want it done now, See, that's why the devil tries to get you in a now crisis. Because if he can create a crisis, he can make you make the bad decisions. But if you can see the overall picture and that it costs less to do it in the long run to do it the right way, then you become a long-term thinker, which means your, your summer, fall, winter, spring, you become a long-term thinker instead of a fireman looking for food in the winter because you have a need now. Is there, anybody understand? You might think this is so plain. Mo so many people miss it. That's where all the debt came from. I can tell you that right now is the impatience. Country's buried because everybody wanted to be in control when everything happened. Now, I'm not saying nobody should borrow money, but I do. So I say that all the time. You got to know when. I think there's a time to borrow, and then there's a time not to borrow. There's things to borrow for. There's things not to borrow for. You have to pay attention to those things. So anyway, focus would be the next one. Uh, I think you have to work at the stage you're in. Look at your fields. You, you, you have to hoe and water, but you don't force. This, is, this one here, to me, I've noticed is a very dangerous time. You get your seed in the ground and you get the plants visible, 
so you think everything's okay, so you just kind of don't do anything for a while and find something. Now, people get bored when things are going good. Did you notice that? Things start going good, they start going AWOL. They start thinking they don't have to do the diligence uh, to make things come out right. The Bible says watch and pray over things. I, I think that uh, your diligence shows your dependency, that you're trusting God. I think that you have to watch what you do and pay attention to what God gave you. Don't laugh, but I mean, Reno come outside sometime in the yard. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm surveying my kingdom. You laugh, but I mean, in other words, I'm looking around the place. I've said this a couple weeks ago. I mean, I, I like this thought of stewardship. I like to know what's going on around the things that the Lord gave me to be over. And if I don't know, I want somebody here to know what's going on around here so they can tell me what needs fixed around here. So they can tell me how, because it all concerns me because it's my responsibility, which would include my wife, my house, my kids, and the church, and whatever God has made me to be over. I, I feel like I need to know this state of the fields. Whatever it is, your vehicles, your health, I think you need to pay attention to make sure things are going right. This just sounds so bad because people don't take care of stuff anymore. We've, we've become disposable. Bic lighter, I call it society. When stuff goes out, you just throw it away. And I guess it's okay, but it sure made stewardship uh, go away. You know, building for the temporary. When we were in Europe uh, a couple years ago, when we went uh, to Croatia and to Italy, you know, those buildings have been around forever. They, there wasn't no temporary thinking there. And when I went to Venice, I thought to myself, they built these buildings so good that it flooded and they're all still here and they're all still using them. <laughs> I thought that's amazing that the place is so good that when it floods, you can just take a boat and go through the buildings instead of, I mean, they're still usable. And, and that long-term thinking, uh, God's a long-termer, isn't he? I mean, you know, God's definitely a long-termer. 